Harvey, thank you so much. I am so great, just grateful that you're here, man, because you have been, I've studied you all these years in the consistency of your playing. It's always been at a high level. You have absolutely opened up a career that has been exciting for others to enjoy watching you perform with all the incredibly great artists that you've performed with, and you do it all the time well. That's amazing. Where did this begin for you? Well, let's see, I started playing drums. I was crawling on the floor in the kitchen, banging on pots and pans with spoons. Huge. Now that sounds like so, but um, I, had a, I had a love affair with rhythm and stuff mm. right from the beginning. And then the earliest opportunity in school when music was a part of education, interesting, which I'm a big advocate for and still fighting for that. Nice. Um, they presented us with what instrument would you like to play? Great, right? <laughs> so of course I said drums and I was seven years old at the time. So I started taking drum lessons in public school education. So it started, th it started that young? That started, yeah. Wow. And I had a great teacher who was a violinist in the Philadelphia Orchestra, but he was the head of the music department, so he taught me drums. His name was Joseph Jacobs. And coincidentally, he knew my father, even though my father was not in my life at that time, but he knew my father as a musician in the army band. That was, he was just an army band. So he saw my talent right away. Mm. And he nurtured it, and he really encouraged me to to continue to play, and he just, just kept pushing me. You know, it was really, I was, I was so fortunate. And at that age, coming from a poor family, that was something that I did really well, so I latched on immediately. That was something that I had that I could do. Powerful. And I took great pride in playing drums, and, and to tell you the truth, I was hoping to bring my father back into my life by playing drums, thinking I would draw attention, you know. It was really my motivation, but I just loved it, and everything that I was taught, I learned. I learned to read right away. I was playing in the orchestra almost immediately. And I ended up, as a kid, being like the, the best drummer around, you know, so <laughs> that started happening right away. So that teacher was kind of like a mentor to you? Oh, yeah. And what do you think that mentor saw in you? Well, he saw that I had some talent, number one, yeah. God-given talent, and then he saw I had drive, hmm. that I really wanted to be really good, and it was something that meant a lot to me, you know. I remember sometimes crying in a lesson if I couldn't do something right away. You know, I did because it meant so much to me. Yeah. And uh, if I made a mistake or something like that, you know, but I learned to read right. Of course, you learn to read right. I was, I was reading and I was playing snare drum, no drum set, none of that. That's the difference between me and a lot of the kids today. They start on drum set and they play drum sets. Yeah. I had a really funny, th I never really had drum lessons on the drum set until I went away to college with Alan Dawson. So that long a time, you just played orchestral drumming. Orchestral drumming, drumming. interesting. Yeah. But, Prior to that, that's not completely true because in the eighth grade, uh, we had a dance band and I didn't have a drum set so I couldn't be in the dance band, but I'd been seeing guys playing drums and all and I was really interested. I was watching big bands and stuff. I said, yeah, that looks like it'd be fun. So I was trying to get to a drum set, but I never did. But I'd go to a drum shop and the guy would let me play around a little bit, you know, but I didn't have any lessons. So then yeah. this drummer got sick the day before the concert at the big band uh, in, that, in junior high school and his drum set was there. And so they asked me if I wanted to sit in and play for them. And I sometimes would go to rehearsals and listen to the stuff. So I started playing the drum set, and I didn't even have any lessons. But I had figured it out. You know, I'd seen little things, and, and I was playing on the pillow and doing this kind of stuff. So I sat in and played the, the gig in the school, and two of the people in the audience were musicians. And one was a bass player, and he asked me, hey, man, you got to play gigs with me. So he called me to start working in hotels and bar mitzvahs and things like that. And there was another guy that was a drummer named Robert Phillips. He said, I know you don't have drums. If you ever need any drums, you can borrow my drums. Yeah, I have drums. <laughs> so the earliest pictures of me are with a, a, a drum from the 50s, one tom, a snare, maybe a tom, <laughs> no hi-hat, bass drum, one cymbal. I mean, I was all mismatched, whatever I could get my hands on. <laughs> so. I was, I was working doing this, you know, and the guys would pick me up and I'd put stuff in the car, no cases, nothing. I mean, you know, I didn't even own cymbals, but I just borrowed a couple cymbals from the school and borrowed some crash cymbals for hi-hats. <laughs> man, it was really a mismatch, you know? But I really wanted it, and then I just started just working at it. And then the guy at the drum store said to me, listen, you can take a drum set and pay me as you want to. Irv Shapiro, I'll never get him. He was a great guy. Where was this now? What, Atlantic City. I'm in Atlantic, Atlantic City. City. 
This guy said you can take the drums. Take the drums and pay me as you get what money. What an opportunity. Yeah, yep, and he was a great guy. And so, of course, I paid him off as a Gretsch drum set, which is my first set. Yeah. And that sort of was the beginning. And then I started just, then I, shortly after that, I got a gig with a kid organ group, and we played at one of the best jazz club in Atlantic City on the off hours. So I was meeting all the great jazz drummers and musicians and everybody, and I was playing off, I'd go to work at four o'clock in, in the morning and work until 10 when the breakfast show. <laughs> See, what happened in Atlantic City, there weren't enough hotel rooms. So mm. people would come in buses and buses, yeah. especially on the north side. So all the, all the African Americans, black people, they had to, they stayed out all night in the clubs. So the clubs stayed open 24 hours. Oh my Lord. So I was lucky enough to work a gig early in the day and then I come back and work the breakfast show and I was still like 16. <laughs> so I worked from 10 o'clock at six, 4 o'clock in the morning to 10 o'clock in the morning when the breakfast show would start. Then they have the breakfast show with the stars, and then they take a break, and then we come back and then they have an afternoon matinee. And then I work between that, and then I go do another job and come back. So <laughs> I, I was having a, and that's when I really started learning what was going on. In yeah. the summers I was practicing all, all the time, and guys would say, try to swim around like this, try that, do that, and I was just a sponge. But this is where I'm so, always so impressed by your natural gift. Yeah. Something was there that allowed you to take these little bits of information and really make it work fast. Well, near the, <laughs> yes. And the other part of that was that I, I was playing orchestrally, so I had chops yeah. to a point. Yeah. And I also played drum and bugle chords. So I had the discipline of playing where we had to play in, in marching and chords and everything had to be exactly uniform. Had to play stick the same way. Precision. Precision. Yeah. So I started playing that when I learned that right away too because it was a chord called the Brigand uh, Seahorse Lancers. And we were a junior corps for Archer Epler, so it was DCI. It was how, DCI stuff. How impressive. So I had that incorporated in my playing, orchestra playing in my playing, and then just playing. <laughs> and all that, I adapted all that to the drum set, all the rudiments and everything, and then that, that was my thing. So you're playing, you're doing your thing. When did Alan Dawson come into the picture? Well, when I went to Berkeley. Right. I had Alan, as, I got Alan's the first semester I didn't have him. I had Fred Buda, which, which was very straight. Was, you know, he's an orchestral, orchestral and he played shows and all yeah, great, yeah. great. So yeah. I had Fred and went through that just fine. Next semester I had Alan and I went in and I played for him and he said, okay, well, let's pull out accents and rebounds. We started doing some stuff in that. <laughs> and then he said, well, I'm going to play vibes and you play drums and then I'll play drums and you play vibes. <laughs> and I was wondering, well, where did the lessons come in? <laughs> And I was really pretty baffled because I spent that whole semester with him not really taking lessons. We did access and rebounds for two lessons and that was it. Every book, books went away. We just talked and just played and just, that was it. And I was wondering, why is this happening? He never really explained it to me, but I think I understood it later. And I think he saw something in me and what I had developed because by that time, I had played with a great pianist from New Orleans named, named uh, James Booker who wrote a song called Gaza, which was famous. Yeah, and I yeah. took James Black's place, who was a great drummer. He had to go away. So I had this, this year of playing with this pro group that was for me to play like Vernell Fournier or play like this guy on this song. Yeah. And so I had some, I had guys bearing down on me. And the club owner was always, he was a big fan, so he was on me, you gotta do this, you know something. <laughs> so I had all, by the time I got to Berkeley, I was pretty seasoned. Yeah. So, and the thing, I think Alan saw it, and I think he saw the component of all the different elements that I had in my life in the music, and he, I don't think he wanted to alter it. Yeah, yeah. And I, I, I figured that out later, but first I was wondering what was going on, you know? But, the, but he was recommending me for jobs. He recommended me for a job with Duke Ellington, which I did, which was amazing. So <laughs> here I was a student, he recommended me to play with Duke Ellington. <laughs> As, I don't know, 67, I get a call. Duke Ellington needs you. Get over to the Globe, to the uh, Prudential Center. I walk in, I got a black suit on, I'm ready to go in the gig. They're just walking on stage, they're just getting ready to play, and I walk on late, because I, you know, they just, uh, who's, the, who's the drummer? Sam Woodyard. Sam Woodyard was at the time. He, he yeah, was oh, wow. sick, he was sick. Yeah, yeah. oh. He, he was uh, a little inebriated. <laughs> so I walk in there and I have a black suit on. Lo and behold, they all have black suits, black pants, white jackets. <laughs> so I walk into the band with a black suit on, first of all, so I'm looking like, what is this? And I'm late walking on there. So there's no music. I'm sitting next to the bass player and the, and, and, and the back bass player's on one side, and the other side's the trumpet section, I think, Cootie Williams. And they're telling me what's coming up next, no music. 
So I played a show <laughs> with Duke, but but that but, but I'm getting off the track here. But that was something that that Alan had, had turned me on to, you know. But these are experiences that you just can't. You just can't. oh man, can you imagine? I got to play with with Duke Ellington. But while I was in college, it was another incredible time because the very first night I was in Berkeley, and I I, I had no money for school. I paid, earned my money, and saved it for myself. I had a loan. It's 13160 to pay every single month. But I was staying in the dorm the first time. Miroslav Butus was one of my roommates in the in the in the, in the wait, wait. serious music. Jan Hammer was there, and we had a group. Uh. We were playing Miles stuff. So the the promoter in Boston, the main guy named Fred, uh, whatever his name is, was calling me all the time for gigs. So I got to work with this guy and this guy and this at Paul's Mall, the jazz workshop. So I was working the whole time. How old are you at this time? Well, well, I'm in college first year, 19, you know? Oh, my God. So, so my, the very first night I'm in Berkeley, I'm sitting in the TV room, because I'm staying in the dorm, and someone says, the phone rings, and they said, they need a drummer, somebody needs a drummer. I, I'm athletic, I jump over the chairs, I'm the first guy to the phone, get down here to the Pussycat Lounge. So I go down the combat zone, and I'm playing in sort of a, Pussycat Lounge, yeah, he's exactly but one, right. of the, one of the piano player happened to be a teacher at Berkeley too. And he was my harmony teacher in my second year, uh, James Progress. So it was pretty amazing. So I worked from the very first day I was in Boston. How and I worked incredible. from then all the way through, the entire time I was in Boston. That is absolutely fantastic. And I worked a lot of different stuff. I did the pops, I did, you know, I did opera with Gunther Schuller. I got to do everything. Yeah. And then I got, to, after the first year and a half, I was invited to go to the New England Conservatory uh, because Berkeley wasn't accredited at the time, and I was an education performance major, and I was taking education courses, but it didn't mean anything because they weren't accredited. Yeah. And I was paying. I didn't get a scholarship to Berkeley. None. I paid everything, so the opportunity to go there to full scholarship, so I took it. And who, who's my teacher? So I walk in, and this guy named Vic Berth is my teacher, which I don't really know who he is yet. Yeah. But, and he told the president of the school, because Gunther Schuler was the one who invited me, he said, you know, Vic says, I, everyone that, that, that takes studies with me has to have, have an audition. Because he was the top guy to have other teachers there. Vic was so high standards. So Vic standard. said, you have, to have, you have to have an audition. So Gunther said, you're going to teach this guy. So I ended up having a lesson with Vic, but I had played timpani in high school, so I was a little ahead of the game. A little bit. Yeah, yeah and I had some balance, a little, you know, a little bit. But uh, right away, we struck up a partnership. And, and, and one of my proudest moments with Vic is, he calls me the hardest working student he's ever had. Yeah. And that's my badge of honor. <laughs> really. And we became friends, and I, had a, I was silly enough to have a child after one year of the college, which I got married, and all, all my baby stuff he gave me to use and his oh, stuff. So, so we became partners for life. What a beautiful guy he was, absolutely, for sure. Oh, know. yeah. As was Alan Dawson, too. Yeah, Alan I mean, Dawson. Just, well, well, Alan Dawson was a sweet guy, too, man. Yeah. And, you know, part of, part of what I love about these conversations, especially for the young generations and future generations to hear, is when you mention a name like Alan Dawson, that they have to go and research who that was yeah. and go research the recordings he played on yeah. and listen to the brilliance of his playing oh, yeah. as a musician. What a beautiful player. Great player, great teacher, great yeah. communicator. You know, he taught Tony Williams. Tony Williams was with Miles at 17. Absolutely. That's unbelievable. You know, I wanted to take his place with Miles so badly. I really did. <laughs> Whenever he left, you know, but that, yeah. was, my, that was my goal. But, but jazz was something that was in my blood from the very beginning. And the other stuff just caught on, you know. So were you listening to all different types of music at that time? Were you yes, I was. Uh, I, I listened to all kinds of music. Uh, of course, I was, from, I was made aware of classical music through orchestras. Right. I was in the All-State Orchestra in New Jersey. I was listening to jazz a lot, but then I got really into jazz, really heavily. But then I was into the Stevie Wonder, and the R&B thing was very heavy, and those guys, and, R and, and, and James Brown, and Otis Redding, and all those great yeah, drummers, and those yeah, grooves, so I was yeah. into that. Because I was playing different kinds mm -hmm. of gigs, so I was always exposed to that. Yeah. And I was in, a, in a, a cover band in college. We were playing all those songs, Otis Redding, and so I had to learn all that stuff, too. So I was listening to a lot of music, a lot of drummers, man. Your, your pocket and your groove when you play is always so crystal clear, and always feels comfortable. So I mean, it, it, all this listening that you took in, how did you get your musicianship to be that clean and that clear? Well, uh, it's, it's, it's a collaboration, of what, it's a mixture. You know, it's a hybrid of everything I have been exposed to. And basically that's what it is, you know? It's, a, it's, a, it's everything, it's like a, a hybrid. You know, I'm a hybrid, and, and, and it's ironic that I get to meet Herbie Hancock and play with him. I was watching him as a kid. And then I get to play with him. I get recommended by Billy Hart, who I met when I was 16. Another great drummer, yeah. Yes. Yeah. So how, how do you figure that? You had this 
this person, Herbie Hancock, that you looked up to, and all of a sudden you're playing with him. Right. We talk about visualizing a dream and achieving it. That's yeah. incredible. Well, um, I've been following them around. I remember Billy would come in town with Herbie. I was always listening to him in college. But uh, by the time Herbie called me, I had been in L.A. I moved to L.A. in 1970 when I graduated. Mm -hmm. And I was, uh, fortunately, I wasn't really playing drums right away. I was playing percussion, you know. They right. didn't accept me as a drummer right away. Interesting. Which is really a blessing because then I got to sit in the percussion chair and watch all the great drummers, how they approached the sessions. Because I, m my dream was to be a session drummer. I, met an art, I read an article when I was in high school. I was going to go to, I wanted to be a lawyer first. And then I read an article because I, I, I wanted something that was respectable. Coming from, from lowly beginnings, you know, yeah, I wanted something that was, yeah. and I saw the musicians coming, I saw how they lived, and it was always tough seeing these guys, you know, yeah, what was yeah, going on. Yeah. So I was going to go to law school, but then I read an article about studio musicians who showed all the guys their shirts and ties and Larry, and talk about Larry Bunker. And I said, hmm, ding, that's what I want to do. So immediately I, I, uh, I applied to a couple of schools and got in and chose Berkeley because Berkeley had a more of a, a current or I would say a more relevant curriculum yeah, rather more, than more just. Contemporary, yes. Yes. educational system. Yeah, yes. yeah, interesting. And I had already taken uh, theory in high school, so I, had, I was ahead of the curve. I yeah. went there and I passed, t tested out of the early stuff. So... It was the school, but then when I found out that it wasn't accredited, that was kind of an issue because I wanted to back myself. I wanted to make sure I, I had some kind of degree that was accurate. You know, what that a, was what a great plan. Now, I would, you came out to L.A., and when you came out here, what, what? First of all, what brought you out to L.A.? Why L.A.? Well, because this is the recording capital of the world. You know. So you just made the move? Yeah, but I, I'd read about it in my high school that the, the guys were all out here recording, so that's where I wanted to come. If we're talking about Larry Bunk and all the guys showed them suits and ties in the studios. That's where I'm going. No question about it. Right in the beginning, I knew that's where I wanted to come. So when you got here, what was it like when you got here? I mean, you were you here, playing I, percussion. I, I, I put on a shirt. I, sometimes I wear a tie, and I'd go to Dante's, which is a club where all the guys hung out after the gig. I remember you, the Dante's, sessions yeah. and meet everybody, give out cards. Finally met Larry Bunker, went to his house. He was living in Beverly Hills. He invited me to come. I sat down and talked to him. Asked him, how do you get in the studios? He says, well, practice. No, he said, no, <laughs> I can't tell you, but if it's going to happen, just be ready, and it'll happen, you know? And I met, met Victor Feldman, and then met another guy. Next thing you know, I finally start getting a call. I got a call. A guy. I did one of my first shows was the Lucille Ball show. I, when I moved here, I ended up getting a job too because man, there's not enough time for me to talk about myself. <laughs> it's amazing, you know, because yeah, I left amazing. college and I left college with a job with Earl Garner, which I was playing with him in the jazz workshop. Earl Garner, what a player! Unbelievable. Oh, and rhythmical, really had. Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then his, it, it, it was just amazing. So I went to Europe with him for seven weeks. When I came back, my wife had moved here, and I came out here. And then someone told me about an audition with, with George Shig, so I went and did that, and he gave me the gig, so I came out here with a gig right away with George Shig. <laughs> I'm playing at the Century Plaza Hotel, and a guy comes in that's the music director for Lucille Ball show. His name is Marl Young. And George introduces to me, he says, oh man, what a wonderful drummer, what a wonderful drummer. I said, yeah, but I play percussion too, you know, blah, 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 blah. He said, really, really play percussion? Yes, sir. Okay, <laughs> he gave me a call. <laughs> I went out there and played there, and then the, the, the contract at Universal saw me, and she started calling me. So then I met Emil Richards and all the guys, and I'm one of the percussion guys. Oh, man. Those days we had six percussions on sessions, you know. Emil, who has done everything. Oh, yeah. And continues to, oh, yeah. in the process. Of what he does. Oh, so, yeah. so, he, so you, drum set, now you're playing drum set, you're doing these sessions, you're doing it. How, oh. did, you, how, how did you keep your schedule organized? Oh, a book. I got a little, little book and just put down what time I'm going to be there. You wrote down, so you had a... Oh, yeah, you know exactly, yeah. Oh, it's, you have to be organized to do this stuff, right? Yeah. Way. Yeah. But um, there's nothing you have to take a course about. It's just, it's natural. You don't mm -hmm. want to miss anything. You don't want to double up on anything. You don't want to mess up on anything. Right. And the rule is, you, once you take a session, that's the date you're going to do. I don't care if something else comes along this bigger. This is what you're going to stick with. You know, very, very rare occasions would you ask off of a job. Well, that's a level of integrity yeah. that really needs to be learned. Well, that really that that uh, that really serves you well because you end up in with longevity. People know they can count on you, right? And people they move sessions to be to have you there and stuff like that. So for you to pass and not be there is not <laughs> a good deal. So, uh, but but I learned the lessons needed to to survive pretty quickly and. Uh, I guess I love playing so many different kinds of music, and I had the opportunity right away to play everything from cartoons to commercials to live shows. I did um, I did some live shows at the Aquarius Theater. I did uh, I can't even think of some of the shows I did, but I did shows. Yeah, you know, and then I uh, worked at uh, worked at Disneyland, and I worked at 
uh, the other place out here, Magic Mountain. And but the, and he, even doing the Academy Awards. I and did that those, about 24 of those. Th that's incredible to have that. I mean, that really is that's the top live, of and that's, yeah. that's... I learned that in Atlantic City. There was a club, show club in Atlantic City called the Club Harlem, and they had all these shows, and they had show girls, and there was a great drummer named Bill Milton, and I used to suffer him from time to time. So I learned how, how to do show drum there. You know, Saul Goodman was from Atlantic City, you know that? I did not know that. Saul yeah, was right. Saul was, and he was out here, and I met him, and we talked about Atlantic <laughs> City, and everything. he was a character. Uh, he really he was, was one of the great show drummers of all time, first yeah. of all. He yeah. played big band with Frank and all that stuff, yeah. but, but he was a great, but show drumming, there's a special art to that. You can't just, just sit down and just, you know, that's a whole deal. Well, you, you gotta listen, you've gotta have fast reflexes, you have to know how to change on a dime to make something happen. And you have to know how to pick up, and you have to know how to carry an orchestra. Yeah. You have to really understand how to play carry an orchestra because one beat can change the entire complexion of the orchestra where the right. time goes. Right, right. So you just learn these things, they're really kind of natural. You know, you just, for me, from having done those shows, and I've worked shows in Lang City. So the work shows, there was a comedian, there was a belly dancer, there was a <laughs> snake dancer, and there was a bird that, that that took off her clothes, you know, and here you had to hit the boom at the right place, the boom or not, right, you know. So I did those kind of shows too. So man. you kept your eyes on that show, right? I had to keep my eyes on that show. I kept my eyes on the snake show. That's the one I didn't like, and I told her, I said, listen, if that snake comes within four feet of my drum, I'm out of here. And you know, sometimes she had a basket, these boa constrictors. She put them in the bathtub, ice water, so their muscles would relax so they wouldn't be able to move as fast. And she'd say, no flash cameras. People flash cameras, and, they would, and you could see them. So as soon as the boa constrictors start coming, to, it seemed like it always wanted to come towards the drum set. I was thinking, like, ding, 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 so they come this way. You know, and I said, "Oh no!" I, I started getting up. Now I stopped, stopped playing. I'm not going to play. Those things, they were nine feet long. She had two of them, and they went a basket. And then she'd take them out and do their stuff with them. And, and sometimes she'd get bitten and snake this, the the, uh, the flash in the camera. Someone would disregard what they said. Yeah. Flash, boom, and you see the two pricks on their arm or something like that. Foreplay. Where did that all come about? Putting the band together. I started being called to go to New York to record with a lot of CTI records, and I met Bob James, and he and I became good friends. Yeah. He played on my records, and I played on some of his records, and, and uh, he wanted to come to LA to record because he hadn't recorded here, and there's a whole different sound and everything here. Right. So I put a band together for him with uh, Lee Rittenauer and Nathan East, who was a new young guy in town who was playing. And we started recording. Actually, I had two, put two bands together for him. And he ended up liking the band that became Foreplay, and we were recording, and he said, would you guys ever consider wanting to be in a band? And to his surprise, everyone said, it'd be kind of cool. Yeah, we'd like it. <laughs> so at the time, he was a, a budding exec at Warner Brothers. And he went to Mo Austin and said, Mo, president of Motel, of, excuse me, the president of Warner Brothers, and said, I have these guys that would love to be in a band, and I'd like to bring a band here. And he said, immediately, yes. So they gave us a great deal. And on the first day of recording, Mo came to the studio and we recorded. And our first record was platinum, and our second record was platinum, and our third record was platinum. <laughs> so we were very fortunate. So after a long career of recording of over 20 years, the opportunity came to form a band and go on the road. Because I didn't go on the road with very many people at all. I, 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 because you, you move, you lose. You know, there's somebody waiting to get in your spot. Absolutely, absolutely. When you're so, out of town, you're out of, out of sight. And I aspired just to be a studio musician. I didn't care about being a star. I didn't care about recording. And, mm -hmm. and even at that point, I had about seven, eight records of my own. So, yeah. you know, I was working a session with the Brecker Brothers, and Clive Davis asked me if I want to record. So I sent him and said, okay, you got a record deal. That's how it happened. I didn't, I didn't want to do that. <laughs> but I took advantage of it. I was writing. I'd learned to write and was writing. So. But uh, then the foreplay situation came up, and we made records. And next thing, here we are, 26 years later, still going, going strong still, too. Well, yeah, a, oh, yeah. Really, really. What, it's, but you, you had to have the area of success that you have had has got to become because you have the gift of playing music. You understand what it takes professionally to make it work. It doesn't just happen by luck to a degree. Yeah. You brought this all about because of the quality of product that you always delivered. I, I think the, the, the quality of product is important. Your attitude is important, yeah. uh, and all the other things that go along. I know, you know, getting along with people and, and recognizing the situation and not being selfish. My mindset primarily was, and a good lesson, is to, to make the producer and the artist happy, the songwriter right. happy. Right. And that was my primary, primary goal. It's, anything else is pretty selfish. So <laughs> Sometimes you get the opportunity to, to they, they let you do exactly what you want to do, what you feel, yeah. and that's great. I find that most often, that turns out to be the things that are really, really special, you know, like all the stuff with Herbie. Herbie never said anything about play like this, play like that. 
and Donald Byrd and those guys, the Blue Note Records, they never said anything. They, they just, just let you go. Just, just go. Right. And that stuff turned out to be great. Foreplay, no question. You know, they, everybody brings their songs in, and we played the music. And, and because, because those guys, everyone has been a sideman, everyone's been a studio musician, everyone understands about adapting, yeah. being malleable. And so the music was always great. Everybody listens, and everybody's a master. So. It was. It really is. It really, had, really works. We had Nathan Easton here, and yeah. uh, we talked to him, and just what a great guy, what a great oh, yeah. musician. Oh, well, he's fantastic, beautiful person. Again, another guy could play anything, any style, anything. His solo yeah. albums are just great. Yeah, I just saw him a couple of weeks ago. I was over there with, with uh, my band, and I saw him playing with Chick for the first time. Yeah, yeah. I didn't see him for a week. He was practicing for a week. But <laughs> you know how the Chick's music is. Oh yeah. But I'm trying to think how many guys that I know on the electric bass that could come in and play that gig without, he had one rehearsal I think. Yeah. And he had the music so I was very proud of him. Nate's, Nate's a very, very special musician. Yeah, great, great guy yeah. too. So, so and think about now this young generation, these names that you've mentioned all need to be researched and looked at. And we have, you know, the internet, Google, you know, oh, drumchannel.com, yeah. they can go yeah. and find all these different, you know, right. ways, you know, drummer world. So many ways that they can research. And that's kind of what, you know, when you mention these names, they gotta go out and do this kind of research. Yeah. And they gotta go out and, and, and they have to earn what you earned. You went and you did the research. You tracked these guys down. You listened to them. You understood them. You studied them. That's an amazing lesson. Yeah, I think so. And I listened to, one of my favorite drummers was Art Taylor. Very, yeah. I mean, not really well known but he did a lot of jazz recordings, but it was always tasty. Yeah. Very tasty and the groove so hard. Then I listened to Buddy Rich, Louis Belson, Elvin Jones, Tony Williams, and on and on. Roy Haynes was yeah. one of my favorites. And, <laughs> and just on and then I started listening to the, the guys playing with James Brown, what they were doing, and the guys pistol playing with Motown, and saw them when they came to town with yeah. Choker Camel's big band. So, yeah. And then I'd see all the big bands playing at the Steel Pier where I had an opportunity to work as well. Great drummer. So I was listening to all the guys. But the one thing I never did was I try, never tried to copy. You know, And if I found something that was appealing to me, I would probably start playing it, but immediately I would adapt it to what I, how I could play it rather than mm -hmm. how they played it. I had that idea in my head, but then I'd go about playing it and it would come out differently and I would accept that as Very you know, important lesson in that process. You know. In closing, if we were gonna give a message to the next generation that we're listening here that, that you could share with them, that could fuel them and inspire them for the hope to continue in the music industry, to right. seek out their dreams, what would you say to them? Well, I think times have changed from the time when I started, which is a long time ago, <laughs> but I'm very fortunate to to continue and be still making great music and making new CDs on my own. And I would say, in today's world, I think you have to, you have to, under, you have to write, you have to understand about engineering, you have to understand about playing, not just one type of, type of music, you have to be well versed in all kinds of music. And you have to really be passionate about music in general. Mm. And I think that's the way you're gonna have longevity. And at the same time, being a person that's not so close-minded that you're not aware of what's going on around the world because yeah. things are changing all the time. Yeah. Electronic music's coming in, uh, I mean, in, but using all the tools that are available to you, you know, and like I started with electronic electronics and, and, and now we're up to Pro Tools and on and on. You must be put, absorbed with all this that's coming yeah. in. Yeah. And a good lesson is a friend of mine, son was a tenor player and he wanted to play a jazz tenor player. And his mom said, well, you talk to him, and, you know, he's going to go to, uh, University of Michigan and so I said sure bring him over so I said what do you want to do with your life do you think he said well, I want to be a jazz tenor player I said so let's talk about this <laughs> you've got one area of music you want to play you're a tenor sax you don't play any doubles or anything yet no no just play that and they accepted you I said you realize that you're going to an incredible music department you need to study orchestration you need to study composition you need to study arranging you need to study scoring for pictures. You need to play double, and you need to play in the orchestra and the band if you can. <laughs> so he played in the big band. He did all that. He finished, and he came out here, and he auditioned and went for a job, and he ended up working with Hans Zimmer as a co-composer. Beautiful. He doesn't even play anymore. Really? But he's working in the business in a major way, and he's happy. He found this thing because, because he diversified. He listened, and he played you know, do those other things. You know. So now he was in that one of his big games. He's doing a big television show, and he's, I mean, they're traveling around playing music for arenas, all because he diversified and found this thing. So I'd say you really must study, you know, all the business aspects of the business and all the musical aspects of business, and just be passionate and wait for it to happen, and don't be afraid to veer off into other areas of music. 
There's a lot of ways to be happy in music. So open your mind, open your heart. Oh, yeah. Try it all, and you never know what tomorrow will bring right. as long as you're true and passionate to your instrument. Exactly. When I grow up, I want to be Harvey Mason. Oh, come on. That's <laughs> for sure. On, Harvey, on behalf of the sessions, thank you so much. You are one seasoned pro. I thank you so much. Thank you.